Hi, and welcome back to Fundamentals of Bioinformatics. This is part two of my sequence homology searching lecture series. In today's lecture, we're going to revisit the algorithm that we explored last time for doing a full database search using pairwise sequence alignment, and then we're going to explore some, vari uh, some variations on that algorithm. We'll compare these variations with the performance of the full database alignment search. Let's start by recapping some of the ideas that we explored last time. In the last lecture, we explored an algorithm for searching a query sequence, which we typically refer to as Q, against a reference database. We'll call our reference database R. And the number of sequences in that database we'll refer to as n, the number of reference sequences. Um, the sequences in that database we can refer to as R1, R2, R3, all the way out to Rn. <clears throat> Now this was a, the, the first algorithm that we looked at here was what I would call a full database search algorithm. And so if we start with just one query sequence, so um, query sequence Q, and we wanna search that against reference database R, presumably so that we can apply uh, sequence annotations from reference database R to query sequence Q. We would do that by performing a pairwise alignment of Q against each individual sequence in R. Now, the annotations, like we talked about last time, that we might be interested in are things like taxonomic information. So what kingdom, class, order, family does this sequence uh, derive from? Or, for example, something like a functional annotation. That could be something like, for example, what uh, gene, what functional gene is this sequence uh, most closely associated with? In order to do a full database search, um, you could think of this um, like if we look at some pseudocode for this. And so pseudocode um, isn't something that we would expect to actually run, but it's something that um, you know, might be a good illustration of how our code would work. Um, we could say something like um, for little r in big R. Um, and so in other words, for every sequence in our reference database, um, we will score the um, pairwise alignment of Q with R. Um, that's an ugly parenthesis. Let me fix that. Um, and so like what this pseudocode is doing here um, is like imagine I have some function that does pairwise alignment. That could be Needleman Wench, that could be Smith Waterman, all depends on the specific um, use case here. Do an alignment of Q with R. And then what I want now is really just like the score of this alignment. And so um, remember like in the last uh, section when we were talking about pairwise alignment, we were mostly interested in the actual alignments. Now we're really mostly interested in the score that we're getting back from those alignments. Um, I might then start um, tallying up my results. Um, and I could um, say append, um, say, the ID of this current reference sequence and the score of that alignment. Um, so now when I'm done with this for loop, that means that I will have performed n pairwise sequence alignments, um, one for each sequence in the reference database. 
What I'm interested in now is the highest scoring sequence, uh, the highest scoring reference sequences when I did these pairwise alignments. Um, and so what I might want to think about doing is setting my results list equal to the reverse sort of my results list. Um, and so again, this is pseudocode. This is not something that we actually expect to work. Um, but you can imagine that like in this case, I might have a reverse sort function somewhere that um, takes a uh, uh, object like this, um, like this results list that I've created, knows how to find the score for each reference sequence, and then returns a new list where the highest scoring entries are first in that list. <clears throat> that would now become, um, based on this pseudocode, the value that I have for this results um, variable. Um, if I might be, uh, say, interested in, um, say, only five results, um, that was kind of what we looked at last time, um, I might then just say something like return results up to five. Um, and so that's a little bit of syntax um, from Python um, that basically means um, give me just the first five entries in this results list. Um, and so I can just throw a comment in there that says um, return Um, let me just return first five entries. Now what that would let me do is it would let me compare the first five, the high, five highest scoring alignments um, or reference sequences that I get back from this database search. And if you have run a blast search, that's very similar to what you get back, but you might in that case get, say, 100 sequences coming back um, from a typical blast search. Um, and so this is more or less our um, function for doing the full database search with pairwise alignment. Um, if you look at the code that I have in the corresponding chapter, um, and we're going to spend a little bit more time with that today. You can actually see how this works in practice. Um, and so that function will take um, the, uh, I think it was the local pairwise, what did we call it? Um, we call it local alignment search. Um, and what that one does is it takes some number of query sequences, takes your reference database, takes the number of hits that you want back, um, and it then computes these pairwise alignments, and then it does a little bit of um, uh, compiling, a little bit of work compiling a table that is a convenient way to present the results back to the user. When we left off last time, we talked about the runtime for these database searches. Um, and what we found was that when I ran this on my computer, it was taking about five seconds per query sequence um, to do the full database search. Now, on the one hand, that's actually um, pretty remarkable. So we did, um, if you recall, there were 5,000 sequences in our subsampled reference database. And so what that means is that the computer was doing 5,000 pairwise sequence alignments in just under five seconds. That's pretty incredible. The issue is that it is not quite fast enough for many of our um, applications. Um, and so if this is taking about five seconds per query, um, you know, for one query, that's fine. For 10 queries, probably also fine. 
But if you think about the number of sequences that you might need to perform this on, this can quickly end up taking a lot of time. Um, for example, if you think about doing a 16S ribosomal RNA survey, um, we may end up with um, potentially millions of sequences. Um, we would typically um, not end up having to do this type of a query, this type of an annotation on all of the sequences that we obtain. Um, and uh, that could be millions, that could be tens of millions, that could even be hundreds of millions. Um, typically the first step in an analysis like that would be to um, identify all of the unique sequences. Um, and so you don't necessarily need to run this type of a, a search um, every time you observe the same sequence. So if we observe the same sequence 10,000 times, we can just run this database search one time. But even so, we may end up with tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of unique sequence variants from a uh, 16S ribosomal RNA survey. Um, and so now if you think about that five seconds per query and then having to run that say 10,000 times or 100,000 times, you could end up waiting a very long time to get your results. Um, for that reason, we tend to not use this complete database search um, uh, approach in practice, but we used what are known as heuristic approaches. Um, and so today we're going to be exploring some of these heuristic algorithms um, and we're going to be comparing them to the full database, uh, database search. But the first thing I want to do before we get into that is just explore the um, runtime and the computational complexity of this local alignment search function. And so what I did here, um, and this is this code comes from the corresponding book chapter, um, but what I did here was I defined a function called tabulate local alignment search runtime. And so this is going to take some query sequences, it's going to take a reference database, and then it's going to allow, allow us to um, specify how many query sequences and how many reference sequences we want to apply our search function to. Our search function that we'll provide is that local alignment search that we um, have already uh, experimented with. And what this is going to do is it's going to run through a few iterations where it does um, some number of queries. So it'll do n query sequences um, against n reference sequences, and it'll tell us the runtime for each of those. If you look um, a little bit deeper in this code here, um, what you can see is that for each combination of number of query sequences and number of reference sequences, it performs three iterations um, just so that it can um, find the um, average runtime of these. And so if for whatever reason one of those queries um, took longer to compute um, or if one of the uh, a search against a reference sequence took long takes longer to compute, um, that should average out here. Um, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run this with 100 query sequences and I'm going to vary, or sorry, 100 reference sequences, and then I'm going to vary the number of query sequences that we have here. Um, and I'm going to call our tabulate local alignment search runtime function. Um, and so I'm going to run that. Um, this might take just a minute to run. Um, but what this is going to do when it completes is it's going to print a table of runtimes out. Um, and so what this is telling us is that when we search one query sequence against 100 reference sequences and our median query sequence length is 200, our median reference sequence length here is 1449, the runtime <clears throat> is about 0.17 seconds. Um, now, recall it did three iterations here, um, and so these are going to be three 
different query sequences and three different reference sequences in each one of these cases. And so that's why we're gonna get a little bit of variation in our median reference sequence length. Um, and we get also get a little bit of variation um, in our runtime here. These are tiny little bits of variation though, so I wouldn't read too much into those. These next few rows are now running five query sequences, um, again against the 100 reference sequences. Um, median sequence lengths are about the same. The median query sequence length, remember, is always the same here because I defined that when I created these query sequences in the last lecture. And so I said that we would always have um, length 200 sequences. Um, and so you can see my runtime has gone up a little bit here. Um, if we follow through the rest of these rows, we can just see that we're increasing our number of query sequences um, and the number of ref, uh, or sorry, the runtime is increasing along with that. Um, like last time in the, or sorry, like the pairwise alignment lectures, it's useful to plot this information. Um, and so if I plot the number of query sequences versus the runtime, you can see what looks like a pretty linear relationship here. That makes sense for this algorithm because what we're doing here is um, our median query sequence is not really is not changing in length at all. The median number of reference or the median length of our reference sequence is changing a little bit, but pretty negligibly. Um, and so what is changing is the number of query sequences. Now, because each query sequence here is searched against all of the reference sequences, and so all 100 of the reference sequences, what that means is the number of pairwise alignments that are being performed in each of these cases is gonna be the number of query sequences times the number of reference sequences. Um, and so that is going to um, uh, be increasing linearly. And so like the number of our, um, the number of our alignments that we perform increases linearly here. Um, and as a result, that is, um, we see that same pattern in the runtime, that the runtime is increasing linearly. Um, part of this is because that pairwise alignment step is the slow step in this analysis. That is like the rate limiting step in our alignment search. Um, if I were to um, modify this, and so what I'll do here is I'll say, I'm gonna change my number of query sequences. So I will only vary the number of query sequences um, or sorry, I won't vary the number of query sequences, but I will vary the number of um, reference sequences. So I'll do say 25, 50, and 75. Um, I'm gonna run this again, and we're just gonna see if we get that same pattern here. So now we've got the same number of query sequences, we are increasing the number of reference sequences um, in a linear fashion. So we're adding 25 each time. Um, and if I then plot this um, again, oh, um, so I need to change this here to be the number of reference sequences. Um, so this time what I did was I plotted um, by accident there. I plotted the number of query sequences versus the runtime. Um, so you can see there was a lot of variation in runtime here, but there was no variation in the number of our query sequences. Um, and so um, if I run that again, you can see now I've got the number of reference sequences changing on the x-axis. Um, and again, it looks like I have a linear relationship here. Um, okay. so. What, we, what our goal here is, is to try and reduce the number, or sorry, try and reduce the runtime of this search. And what I just, what I just told you, and what you can probably um, just imagine from thinking about this, is that the slow step here 
is doing this pairwise alignment. Um, if we look at the um, if we look at our alignment search function again, um, you kind of have to take my word on this, but this is really like where we do this alignment. So on this line that I just highlighted here, this is where we're spending most of our time. If you wanted to actually figure that out, like if you wanted to know for a fact that that's where you were spending your time, you could use um, what's called a code profiler. Um, and so Python has a built-in profiler. You could run that and it would tell you what line of code or what lines of code it was spending the most time on. Just take my word for it that it is spending the vast majority of its time doing that pairwise sequence alignment. Um, the rest of the things that we're doing in here, like doing some sorting, um, doing uh, building up a table, these can take a little while, but um, with respect to how long the pairwise alignment takes, um, those run times are, are pretty negligible. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of ways that you can think about um, reducing the run time here. Um, one of those would be, say, running on a faster computer. Um, that would work. That would, you know, maybe we'd get down to two and a half seconds or one, even one second um, per database search down from five. Um, but we would still end up with the same issue that if we need to do 10,000 sequences, um, say, or 100,000 sequences against a really large reference database, this might take um, more time than we want to wait for that. Um, so even if it's, you know, a really long, really large amount of time, say divided by four, divided by five, it's still, you know, that can still be a really large amount of time that we don't want to wait for this. Um, so the real key here, like the way that we can solve this is by getting our alignment search function to perform fewer alignments. Um, and so if we are spending all of our time doing alignment, it sort of makes sense that if we do fewer alignments, we can, um, uh, we can speed this up. And so the question is, how can we do fewer alignments but still get the right result? And so is there some way that we could do this database search where we only look um, at aligning against some of the reference sequences, not all of the reference sequences, but still get the closest matches in this reference database. If we can figure that out, we can really stand to improve the runtime of these searches. Um, and so a heuristic algorithm is what we would try to apply to do this. Um, and so what we want to know with a heuristic algorithm um, would be really two things. We would want to know how often does our heuristic fail to get the right answer. Um, and so if we don't align against all of the sequences in the reference database, how frequently are we going to miss the best sequence, the closest match in that database? The other thing that we need to balance that with is how much faster is the heuristic than doing the complete database search? Um, and what we really care about here is that we get enough of a reduction in runtime that it justifies our use of this heuristic algorithm. And so in other, in other words, um, it justifies our not being guaranteed to get the best answer. Um, and so this is gonna have to be quite a bit faster in order to make it um, you know, tolerable to potentially not get the right answer. Um, so you might think like, this just sounds, um, like a bad idea. We should always try and get the right answer. Um, and, you know, in theory, that's exactly right. Like, we always want to get the right answer when we're doing this type of a database search. When you do a blast search, you really want to know, am I getting the closest match in that reference database? The problem is, 
it's just not practical. Um, we would not be able to do things like regularly search against the BLAST database, or sorry, the NCBI databases with BLAST, if we were doing a full alignment search every time, if we were doing pairwise alignments of our query against every sequence in the reference database every time. Um, and so what we're going to do now is we're going to look at a few different ways that we could try and define heuristic algorithms that will do fewer pairwise alignments for us. And this first one that we're going to look at is um, what I like to think of as sort of a straw man um, approach. And so how would we do on these two metrics, so like our accuracy and our runtime, if we just selected some random sequences from the reference database to search against. And so I've defined a function here called heuristic local alignment search random. What this one does, it looks a lot like our initial function, um, our local alignment search function. It takes queries, it takes a reference database, it takes this new value P that I'm gonna come back to in a second, takes the number of hits that we want, and it takes our aligner function. What this P function is, is it's a percentage that we are going to um, use to subsample our reference database. Um, and so what I'm doing here is I'm saying that I want to define a new value K, which is going to be P times the length of the reference database. And so if, um, say, P is um, 0.1, so 10%, and the length of our reference database is 5,000, then K will get the value of 500. What we're then going to do is we're going to use that random sample function that we used earlier um, with this reference database that was provided as input and then value K. And so that'll give us in my example, that might give us 500 sequences coming back. And then we're just going to call our local alignment search function with that smaller database, so with the subset of our reference database. Um, and so what this is going to do, again, is it's just going to, rather than search against the whole database, it's just going to search against some random uh, subset of that database. So I'm just going to execute that cell. Um, I am going to um, get some queries. And so here I'm just going to take um, 10 queries this time. I'm using that random sample function again. Um, and now I can generate my results. And so these results will be um, very similar to what we generated above, except it's only going to be against this 10% subset of our reference database. So I'm going to go ahead and run that. Um, again, this will just take a second. Um, we're doing 10 queries this time. Um, and you can see that the results that I'm getting look really similar to what we got above in terms of um, the output that we're getting here. So I'm getting, I'm having this code print out the closest taxonomies from those reference databases for this first query and then for this second query and so on. Um, and so initially, it's pretty hard to tell, like, how did we actually do? Did this do worse than last time? Um, well, remember we uh, computed that last time by looking up the known taxonomy for each of these. Um, and so, um, for example, like this known taxonomy for uh, query sequence 431-5890 was um, the lowest named taxonomic identity that we get for this is Helicobacteraceae. Um, if we scroll up and look at our results, you can see that that was actually the first hit. And so there we actually did pretty good. Um, if we look at this next one, um, you can see like we had the order um, Legionellus or Legionellus. Um, if we come up here, 
Um, you can see that that was not what we got for our first hit, um, but it did show up as our second hit, did not show up in any of our other three. Now, of course, we don't know how that would have done right now if we search this against the full database. Um, it's possible that if we did not do that random sample that we would have had a few more of this order showing up in our, um, in our top hits. Um, we don't know that right now. Um, so what we really need to do is have some way of evaluating this search. And so what I want to know here is um, how often am I getting the right answer? Um, and so I defined a new function in here called evaluate search. And what this is going to do is it is going to tell me the um, runtime for um, using a particular search function. And it's going to tell me how many times I get the right answer at a given taxonomic level. Um, and so when I say at a given taxonomic level, um, like here you can see I'm defining taxonomy levels five. And so what that means is I would want to know, um, this would be our first level, second level, third, fourth, fifth. And so what I am going to be doing with this function is I'm going to say like at some specified taxonomic level, if I say five, that's going to mean the family level with this algorithm, how many times um, or like how frequently am I getting the correct taxonomy assignment at that taxonomic level? Um, the way that I'm computing that is um, by finding what the most common taxonomy assigned is at that particular level. And so of the top five, what is the most common taxonomy that I get at level five? Um, and so don't worry too much if you don't follow all this code. I present it here so that you can poke through it a little bit um, if you want to learn about it. Um, if you're really trying to understand how these algorithms work, I recommend spending some more time with it. Um, but for now, I'm just going to execute this. Um, I'm going to define this as um, taxonomic level five. And the first thing that I'm going to do is I am going to evaluate this search when I use the full local alignment search function. Um, and so this is going to be if I do all of the data, uh, the entire database. And so I'm going to run this. It's going to take a second to run. And when we get the results, it'll make a little bit more sense, I think, um, exactly what it's doing if you've had a hard time following this so far. So this is just taking a few seconds to run. We'll just keep waiting for it. Remember, this one is doing our full database search. Um, it's doing it with 10 queries this time. Um, and so it's going to take a little bit longer than last time. Um, and so I, I'm running that with our current queries, the full, or sorry, like our initial subsampled reference database of 5,000 sequences. Um, and it just completed. Um, and so what this is telling me is that when I do the full search, so using our local alignment search function, it takes four and a half roughly seconds per query. 90% of the time I'm getting the right answer at the family level. Um, and so this is first printing out the known taxonomy. So this is the actual taxonomy associated with this query sequence. And then it's printing out the observed taxonomy. Um, and so what our search result returned. Um, if we poke through this a little bit, um, we can see like this first one is one of our nine out of 10 correct answers. Um, and so here you can see that at all five taxonomic levels, 
we have the same taxonomy. So our known matched our observed. The second one is that one error out of 10 that we got here. Um, and so you can see that this is um, where uh, we were actually just looking at this one above, um, but we have a different sequence or a different taxonomy at the order level for our known sequence um, than the observed, or sorry, our known taxonomy. So this is the actual taxonomy. This was our observed or reported taxonomy. And so they differ at that fourth level. And so if these differ in any one of these five, um, this evaluate function is going to consider that an error. The rest of these all match, and so that was our 1 in 10. So now what we're going to do is we are going to run this with our random local alignment search, um, where we look at a random 10% of the database, and we want to compare how often we get the correct answer and how long it took per query sequence. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna run this cell. Um, this one should, should take a lot uh, shorter. Um, and so it did uh, much quicker this time. So you can see that we are now at about 0.44 seconds per query. That's actually about 10 times faster than our previous search which makes a sense because we're doing one-tenth of the number of alignments here because our database is just a random 10%. Um, but we're getting correct answers um, only 60% of the time now. Um, and so we're still getting an error on this um, second one here. Um, we are also getting an error down here. We're getting an error here and we're getting an error here. So four out of 10 times, we're getting an incorrect answer. Um, now, because this is a random 10%, um, we can run this a few more times. And since this one is quick, let's just go ahead and do that. Um, so this time, we actually did quite a bit worse in terms of number of correct answers. So we got 40% right this time. Um, and so, um, again, because we're looking at a random 10% of the database, the answer that we're going to get is different each time because there's different sequences in that reference. Um, so I'm going to run this again just for fun. Um, here we're back up to 60% correct answers, and let's just round it out, do it one more time. Here I'm getting 50% correct answers. And so you can see we're in that 40 to 60% range with this random search. Um, that seems quite a bit lower than what we were getting with um, our, our full search. So when we we're getting 90% correct answers, um, it's a lot quicker. Um, and so, you know, maybe if you just wanted a really quick glimpse, um, this would be acceptable. Um, to me, it feels like the um, it feels like this is not quite um, worth it. One other thing I want to point out here um, is that we are currently looking at um, five taxonomic levels. If we change that so that this function only cared about say three taxonomic levels, and so it only went out to the class you can see we would be doing a lot better. Like here, we would still have an error, um, but uh, and here we would have an error, and so we'd have about 80% of these correct. But the trade-off there is we have much lower taxonomic resolution there, um, and so there's a lot more um, bacterial variation, bacterial archaeal variation at the class level than there is at the family level. Um, and so while we would be getting um, accurate results at the class level more frequently, it would be a much lower resolution taxonomic assignment. Um, and so that might not be exactly what we're looking for. Okay, so this I said was a straw man approach. Oh, and I do just wanna remind you, if you're following along with me, the results that you're gonna be getting 
um, both for the full database search and for this heuristic search are gonna be a little bit different because remember we started each with um, a different random subset of our full reference database and then we've also defined our query sequences at random differently from one another so when you ran it on your computer you are um, uh, almost certain to have a different set of random sequences than I have and so don't be surprised if you're getting some different results than I am um, overall these patterns should be similar um, okay so let's think about what are some other ways that we could select a subset of sequences from our reference database to search against and what we want to think about here is how could we be most likely to search our query sequences against reference sequences that are likely to be good matches? Um, and so random, um, you know, we're, we're not really um, uh, putting any good ideas into there um, for how to like select sequences that are most likely to be good hits. Um, and so one thing that we can do is we can try and do something um, quicker to figure out which sequences in the reference database are more similar to our query sequence. Um, and that could help us to try and perform fewer sequence alignments. Um, the, and so I think of these as being composition-based um, approaches for um, uh, doing this uh, sampling. And so what I mean by that is we want to search sequences that look pretty similar to um, our query sequence um, in terms of their composition, their nucleic acid composition, for example. And one of the approaches that we have talked about um, in this course is uh, for getting a measure of the composition is to compute the GC content of a sequence. And so the num the fraction of the sequence that is um, either G or C. Um, and so if we were to compute the, uh, sorry, if we were to think about the sequences in the database that have the, um, the best alignments to our query sequence, those probably, probably would also be sequences that were similar in GC content. Um, because these are close matches, they should have similar GC content um, to one another. Um, you know, if they were very different in GC content, that would probably imply more substitution events. Um, and so that would imply then probably a lower scoring alignment. Now, this isn't guaranteed to be correct, um, but that's kind of the idea with a heuristic is we're not guaranteed to get the best sequence in our database, but we're trying to figure out how we can maximize how frequently we're getting the best sequence in the database, the best matching sequence in the database. Okay, so what we're gonna do with this GC content-based search is we are going to compute the GC content of our query sequence. Then we're gonna compute the GC content for all of the reference sequences in our reference database. And then we're gonna search um, just uh, like by definition here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to search the 500 sequences in our reference database that have the most similar GC content to our query sequence. I'm picking 500 here um, so that this is um, relatable to the random search that we did just a few minutes ago. Um, and so um, before we were experimenting with a 10% um, uh, random sequences, now we're gonna be at about 10% of the sequences that have the most similar GC content. Um, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and run these two cells um, and this is going to define this GC content search heuristic. Um, and we want to know the same thing. If we now run our queries, 
how often do we get the right answer and how much are we reducing runtime? And so I'm running this again now. Um, and again, this one might take a minute. Um, okay, so um, this one looks pretty good. So we actually reduce our runtime down to 0.51 seconds. And so again, that's about 10 times faster than before. Um, and so this is actually like pretty comparable to what we're getting with our random search. Um, and we're getting 80% correct answers this time. Um, and so it does look like this was an improvement over random. Um, now this one is um, not, this one is um, deterministic. So there's no random step um, in here, if I remember correctly. Um, and so there's not really any point in running this multiple times. Um, I'm going to go ahead and do that again just to confirm. But I think we should be getting the exact same answer this time. Um, and so I just introduced the term deterministic um, and uh, a contrasting term non-deterministic are two terms that are used to um, discuss algorithms frequently. A deterministic algorithm is going to give you the same answer, um, so it'll produce the same output whenever it's given the same input. A non-deterministic algorithm, on the other hand, um, usually has some sort of a random step built into it, and so um, a non-deterministic algorithm will not necessarily give you the same answer as output for every bit of input that you give it. Um, now you may, um, th this 80% is actually a little high for what I typically expect this, um, this heuristic to give us. Um, and if you have a different reference database or different query sequences than I do, um, you might be getting some variation on this. So you might not quite see something as high. You may see 80%, you may even see higher. Um, but I think, you know, if everybody in the class were to run this, I think on average we would end up with um, a little bit lower than 80%. Um, but still, you know, this 80% gives us a little bit of room for improvement still. Um, our full algorithm achieved the correct answer 90% of the time. Here we're getting the correct answer 80% of the time, but we're doing it 10 times faster than before. And so that's really a huge improvement. And what we might want to think about doing next is trying to see if we can get up to that 90%. Um, and so there's another um, composition, sequence composition based approach to doing this that I'd like to discuss now. Um, and this approach is based on what's known as the Kamer content of the sequence. Um, and so first, let's talk about what these Kamers are. Um, Kamers are something that are that come up pretty frequently in analysis of biological sequences. And very simply, what they are is um, adjacent nucleotides of length k from a sequence. Um, and so, for example, um, the scikit -Bio library um, has a method on the DNA sequence object called Kamer frequencies, where you can provide a length, say k, um, and it will give you all of the um, length k words from that sequence. Um, and so let me just run this, um, and I think it'll be a little bit clearer after I do that. Um, but what this is telling me here is that the kmer, in this case, the k is 5, so the 5mer, the length 5 sequence, um, ACCGT appears once in this sequence. Um, and so here you can see ACCGT, that appears um, first in the sequence. First five bases are ACCGT. There's another camera in here, CCGTG, um, and that is gonna be the next five bases in this sequence. And that camera also shows up one time in this sequence. 
Um, if you sort of work through all of these, um, you will see um, that these all, some of these show up more than once in a sequence. And so, for example, TGACC um, apparently shows up two times in this sequence. And so I see it once here. So TGACC. And then I'm just scanning through and I see it again here. So TGACC. And so that KMER, that fivemer, shows up twice in this sequence. Um, if we vary the value of k, um, and so if I were to say go down to k equals 3, that would show us the 3 mers that show up in this sequence. And so, like for example, ACC apparently shows up four times in this sequence. Um, I see it here. I see it here. I see it here. And I see it again there. Um, and so, you know, if we were to go up to, say, let's go up to 12, um, just to go higher. Um, now, these are going to be all the 12 mers in this sequence. Um, and so, this first one um, is going to be these first 12 bases. Second one will be the next 12. They're overlapping. Um, and so, it'll start with that second base. I don't know if I highlighted it correctly there. Um, but I think you get the idea. Um, now, I want to mention that this is actually a simple extension of the idea of GC content. Um, and so if I were to set um, G equal to, or sorry, K equal to one, um, so the one mers that we would have from this would be A, C, G, and T. Um, and so, you know, this is um, pretty closely related here. Um, in GC content, we're basically considering there to be like two states in this sequence um, where G and C are combined as one state and A and T are combined as another state. Um, and so, you know, as we get longer, it tells us more and more about the unique features of these individual sequences. Um, and so like here, you know, you can see um, that we have eight, uh, eight A's, eight C's, five G's, and six T's. Um, and so our GC content would just be the C's plus the G's divided by the length of the sequence. Um, now I'm going to go back up to five here. Um, and I want to talk about um, how we could use this in a search function. Um, and so if we were to compute all of the KMERS from a query sequence, um, we could then compare that to all of the KMERS in a reference sequence. And we could prioritize doing pairwise alignments between sequences that have many KMERS in common with one another. Um, this is actually pretty close to what the BLAST web server does. Um, it looks for sequences that are subsequences, sorry, that are exact matches between a reference sequence and a query sequence, and it only aligns the references and the queries if they have um, a relatively large number of exact matching subsequences or KMERS between them. Um, and so we could define a function um, down here. So what I'm doing is I'm defining um, a function called fraction shared KMERS. Um, and what we could do is we could provide the KMER frequencies from one sequence and the KMER frequencies from another sequence. So like these could be the KMER sequences in our query and these could be the KMER sequences in our reference database. Um, and it is going to tell us what fraction of those are observed in both of the sequences. And so which KMERS show up in both sequences. We could then do something very similar to what we did with our GC content search, where we would say we're only going to search sequences. Um, we're only going to search, say, or we're only going to do alignments with, say, the 500 sequences that have many shared KMERS, um, so that have like the most shared KMERS between the sequences. Um, and so the idea there is that should narrow in even further on the number of sequences, or sorry, on the similarity of the sequences 
um, the similarity of the reference sequences to our query sequence that we're choosing to do alignments between. Um, and so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to execute those cells. I'm going to define k as 7 for the purpose, uh, for the purpose of this. Um, and then I am going to um, do um, another one of these database searches. So this time I am going to be doing a heuristic local alignment search KMERS um, and I'll be using that same database subset size that I had defined above. Um, you can see this one is taking a few minutes to run, but again, this is going to be doing 500 alignments, um, and it's going to be doing those alignments only against the sequences, the 500, the 500 sequences that have the most KMERS in common with each one of our query sequences. Um, again, we've got 10 query sequences. Okay, so now you can see we got these results. If we compare on our two metrics again, seconds per query and fraction of correct answers, you can see we have now matched the performance of our full database search in terms of the number of correct answers. The only one that we're getting incorrect is that same one that we got incorrect when we did the full alignment search. However, we have increased the runtime of this. Um, and so this doesn't really seem like a very good heuristic here because we're not guaranteed to get the right answer and we've increased our runtime. So you might wonder, why, how can this possibly be similar to what the BLAST service is using? Because we would need this to run in considerably quicker time for this to be worth it. Well, the, the catch here, and what's cool about something like a Kamer search or even the GC content search, is we can actually pre-compute all the Kamer frequencies for our database and we can reuse those over and over again. Um, and so what I'm doing here now is I am computing the KMER frequencies for every sequence in our reference database. And I can do that one time, and that might take a while. That Even if that takes, you know, say an hour, which it's not going to here, I don't really care because I only have to do that one time. And then when I run a database search, I can have that database search use those existing KMER frequencies for all of the reference sequences and just compute the KMER frequencies for our query sequence, um, uh, the query sequence that's provided as input, compare that to the pre-computed KMER frequencies for the reference database, and then do the database search. Um, and so right now you can see this is taking a little while to compute those reference database KMER frequencies. Um, but we'll just wait again for that to complete. That's done now. Um, and now what I can do is I can um, call this local alignment heuristic um, with KMERS. And I'm going to provide those database KMER frequencies as input. Um, and I can then run this search. And we'll see how long it takes this time. Um, okay, so here we go. So now I got some results coming back. Again, I got 90% correct answers. And so I have matched the performance of that full database search. And I'm now down to 0.8 seconds per query. Um, and so I've gotten quite a bit faster, maybe not quite um, 10 times as fast, maybe about five times as fast or so, um, but I am getting 
the same results that I got with my full database search. And so to me, that feels like a really valuable heuristic. It's running a lot quicker and it's getting um, similar uh, results in terms of the fraction of correct answers as uh, we get with our full database search. Okay, so I'm gonna wrap this lecture up here. I highly recommend that you are reading the book along with watching these lectures. The book goes into additional detail on some of these ideas. Um, it probably fills in some gaps on things that I am not covering um, in the lecture content here. Um, so read that, work through this. Um, I would recommend running these notebooks and running them a few times so you can get an idea for some of the variation um, in these results. Um, next time we are gonna start talking about um, a few ideas um, that'll sort of wrap up our database searching. Um, one of them is identifying how frequently, or sorry, how we know if a result that we're getting back from this search is statistically significant. Um, and so that's what we'll spend most of our time on in the next lecture. Okay, I'll see you next time.